Okay, hi everyone. This is going to be the lecture for chapter 19. We're going to be talking about uh, corporate formation, reorganization, and liquidation. Kind of the front and back end of the corporate life cycle, right? Like starting a corporation, uh, liquidation of a corporation, what are the tax consequences of that? So this chapter uh, and a lot of the chapters moving forward, right? One of the things we have to uh, realize here is that anytime we dispose of an asset, this triggers a realization event, basically a change in economic circumstances. And a disposition event, right, always triggers the amount realized minus adjusted basis uh, equals your realized gain. And as a general rule, right, the realized gain is going to be the recognized gain unless there's an exclusion or deferral principle. Basically, if you just want to remember from tax one, if you dispose of an asset, you have this guy right here, amount realized minus adjusted basis. And each has their own tax formula, right, for how you calculate what you realized versus your adjusted basis. So why do we care about basis uh, in general, right? What's the big deal here? Well, we said one of the reasons we care about it is because if we dispose of an asset or dispose of uh, our shares in a company, right, we need to know what our basis is because that's a disposition event. Uh, it's also important in other chapters that we're going to talk about because it helps tell you whether or not you're allowed to use a loss from a flow through entity, as well as how to treat distributions from uh, an entity you're an owner in. Those are more pass through entities, but for purposes of this chapter, let's just say, hey, we care about basis because if we have stock ownership in a corporation and then we sell that stock, that's a disposition event. And then we have to have the amount realized minus the adjusted basis formula. So this is just showing you an example here, right? It says, hey, uh, you bought Apple stock for 100 bucks, you sell it for 300. Your tax basis would be 100, basically your cost. And your gain here would be 200. You bought it for 100, sold it for 300, you made 200. Your basis here was um, 100. Generally, it's gonna be what you paid for at your basis. If it's a uh, business item, it could be your cost minus your accumulated depreciation. So in those scenarios, the one we just talked about, we said, hey, you gave cash for Apple stock and Apple um, was like already a business, right? And it was, you're, you're just a minute small shareholder among millions of other shareholders, right? But let's say instead of giving cash for Apple stock, you gave property for Apple stock. And uh, the idea here is when you give property as well, right? And just imagine you gave a machine and you receive stock right here. That's a disposition event for purposes of that machine, right? Uh, there's kind of two things here. Let's just give a story. You start a corporation you have a machine that would be really good and useful in that corporation. So you say, hey, here's the machine. Give me uh, stock in the corporation. That's transaction one. Later on, you then go and you sell your stock in that company. That's transaction two. You come to us, your CPA, and you say, hey, I just sold my stock in that company. Uh, and we would say to you, okay, well, that's a realization event. You need to use that amount realized minus the adjusted basis formula. We know what you sold the stock for, but you have a little bit of a tricky basis scenario here, right? Um, what is your basis in it? Because you got it by giving a machine. You didn't just pay cash for it. So let's look here. It says, with some numbers, right? Assume you bought a machine for a thousand bucks, that's your basis in it. You give it to a corporation for stock worth $1,500. Uh, thus, just like if you sold the machine for cash and you had to calculate your gain, you have to do the same thing here, right? So 1,500 bucks, a thousand bucks. However, what you're gonna say in this case is, 
All I'm really trying to do is help create or form a corporation. If you tax me on this machine for stock transaction, right? Like I have a $500 gain upon which I have to pay tax. I'm less likely to contribute or form businesses. Also, my stock here, this isn't really liquid, right? I just have a piece of paper, an electronic document. I don't have the money to pay this tax bill. This isn't a good policy for society. Congress then replies, and this is kind of you know what I'm teeing up here for what's going on. Basically, they're gonna let you defer this gain right here, this $500 realized gain. You can defer it until later on. Uh, you kick the can on the gain. So even though you realize 500, you can defer that 500 until a later point in time. Now, how you defer that $500 is basically by adjusting your basis in that stock you received. So in other words, what you're gonna do as a general rule is have a carryover basis. So here, whatever your basis in the machine was, a thousand bucks, becomes your basis in the stock. That way, if you went and sold the stock right afterwards for 1500 bucks, and your basis in it was a thousand, you will have realized that $500 gain that you kicked the can on, right? That was the deferral. So that's like a high level framework, right? I'm just showing you kind of like the arguments, why you should care, what's going on. There's a lot more specific provisions to that, but this is just an orientation for what we're gonna be learning about. Specifically, this chapter, we're gonna be talking about corporate formation. And we're gonna say, hey, if we form a corporation and there's property for stock, uh, from the shareholder's point of view, right? These two guys right here, shareholder, what is their uh, gain or loss on the sale or on the disposition event from that property? And then what is their basis in that stock they received? From the corporation's point of view, right? They gave stock for a machine. Did they have a gain from this? And then what is their basis in that property they received, the basis in the machine? That's the front end. On the back end, we're gonna talk about, hey, when a corporation dissolves, right, upon dissolution of a corporation, and it pushes out its assets to shareholders for their stock, uh, we wanna know what is the corporation's gain or loss. And then from the shareholder's point of view, did they have a gain or loss? And what is their basis in the property they receive? So basically, hey, the corporation is dissolving, I own some stock in it, that corporation. They then push out some assets to me and say, hey, our, we're coming to the end of the road. This is what you get for your stock. Uh, maybe you get the machine or you get some other piece of property. We wanna know uh, what is your gain or loss and what is your basis in that item. So continuing here. So we said, right, one type of disposition or realization event, and this goes back to the original example, is when a shareholder transfers cash and non-cash property to a corporation for their stock. We said technically, while well, this is a realization event, Congress provides for a deferral uh, of it to encourage people to you know, form and create corporations. And then we said how mechanically they have this deferral is through taking a carryover basis in the stock uh, they receive. So the machine basis is now your stock basis. However, this is where I said there's more specific criteria, right? In other words, to receive deferral, you have to meet all of the IR Internal Revenue Code Section 351 requirements. This is the specific criteria. In other words, in order to defer the gain, you have to uh, basically transfer property for stock. And immediately after that transfer, uh, the shareholders have to control the corporation to which the property was transferred. Three requirements, right? It only applies to the transfer of property to a corporation, which means cash or intangibles, not services. The property has to be exchanged for stock, not for things like debt, warrants, or boot. And the shareholders have to control 
the corporation, which is an 80% role immediately after the transfer. So let's look at 19.1 here and 19.2. So 19.1 says, hey, a shareholder provides services in exchange for 10% of stock of a corporation uh, that has a fair market value of $60,000. In this case, right, we're not meeting, we didn't transfer property, we transferred services, which means we have to pay tax on that whole gain, right? In distinction, example two here says, hey, a shareholder has an intangible and they exchange that for $60,000 worth of stock. All of that $60,000 gain is gonna be deferred because we meet the requirements of 351. We've transferred property here. Let's look at 19.2. This is showing us uh, an example. It looks like a shareholder exchanges a machine for a bond from a company. Uh, and they'll have a $60,000 gain. Well, in looking at this, right, while we, we did transfer property, we didn't do it for stock, we did it for debt, right? So what that means in this case is, we can't defer the gain, we have to recognize it now. So with regard to control, right, we said that you have to have control, and this basically means that when measured collectively based on the shareholder transfer group, so all of the people who contributed items uh, in that single transaction, when you measure it right after that transaction from the people who made the contributions, they have to own 80% of the corporation, the voting share and the number of shares. So let's look here uh, at, at an example 19.3 and 19.4 and see what's going on. So 19.3, right, if we look at this, looks like we have a sh two shareholders, they form a corporation. Six months later, uh, a shareholder exchanges property for $60,000, uh, the stock that they receive. So basically, hey, they put property in, they get 10% of the stock that's worth $60,000. Will this new shareholder uh, be able to defer the gain, right, uh, from it. They, you know, that's their gain. Well, no, the idea here is they only own 10%. Um, when you look at the transfer or group, so here's the transaction, uh, property for stock. The only transfer her here is shareholder one. Immediately afterwards, uh, they don't own 80%. They only own 10%. So they do not meet the control requirements. In distinction here, we have shareholder one, two, and three form a corporation. Uh, shareholder one has 25% in exchange for services. Uh, shareholder two and three do property. Will shareholder two and three defer recognition? Well, the idea here is when we measure it just from the people who are contributing property, they only own 75% not 80%. Therefore, they're not eligible for the deferral rules under 351. So as I hit, like, you know, that kind of shows here, a shareholder cannot contribute to services. That showed that there in that second part of the example. However, there are situations uh, where you can include that shareholder. Um, it's called uh, basically like a relatively small value where the services are very small believe that's in 19.4 here where it shows you it's you know below uh, 10%. Don't worry about that for the exam. I'm more concerned that you just know the basics, right, of transfer of property for stock, where when you look at the, the transfer group afterward, measuring them collectively, they own 80% of it. There are some kind of exceptions down here. Uh, right now, we're just focusing on the basics of it. So now we're gonna look at the tax consequences to the shareholder, right? We said generally they're gonna have a carryover basis. Whatever their basis in that machine was that they contributed is now their basis in the stock. Let's look at 19.6. So it looks like a shareholder transfers inventory building and a land 
to a corporation for 50% of the corporation, uh, basically that has a fair market value of 300,000, right? And essentially what they're showing here is uh, the fair market value of the inventory, the building and the land, and then their basis in it, right? Uh, and if we look here, each one has kind of a fair market value, adjusted basis, fair market value, adjusted basis. We can see here that in this case, the adjusted basis, our basis in the three items we gave is 175,000. That's what we care about. This is where things get a little bit, you know, as a general rule, right? The um, stock that we would receive, assuming this qualified for section 351 treatment would be our basis in this 175,000. Where it gets tricky in this case is that the corporation assumed some liabilities. In other words, here, what's going on is, let's say in addition, the corporation assumes a mortgage of $75,000 on the land building. Okay, we contributed land in a building with a basis of that amount, but there was still a mortgage on it. It would be like if you gave someone your home uh, for something, but that home had a mortgage, and now the person who you gave the home to is taking on the mortgage. Well, in this case, right, what we received is worth 300,000, but we also received an indirect benefit, right? That assumption of the liability. That's gonna uh, increase our amount realized, which is going to, uh, in, this key, in this case, uh, increase our gain, our realized gain. But remember, we said because, and assuming this were to meet section 351 requirements, we have to defer that gain. Right, so what we have to do then is modify our basis. Historically, we would have just taken that carryover basis, the 175 here is now our basis in it, but we have to subtract from that in order to make the math work here, the assumption of that mortgage. So in other words, now our basis is gonna be 100,000. So if we sold it for 300,000 what it's worth, and our basis is 100, when we kick the can on that $200 gain right here, we did it by modifying the basis to 100,000, showing a little twist on it. General rule is carryover basis, 175. If the person you, you transfer the uh, property to assumes a mortgage, you subtract that from your basis. That's you know your carryover basis less that assumption of liability. Uh, again, that's assuming that it meant 351 requirements. If it doesn't meet section 351 requirements, essentially all you're doing then is just taking uh, this gain right here, all of it's uh, gonna be recognized, right? And then your basis and the stock you received is gonna be its fair market value. So again, two ideas here from the shareholder point of view. If you uh, meet 351, defer the gain, your basis generally is a carryover basis. If you don't meet 351, recognize the gain and your basis in the stock you received is its fair market value. So this is just showing you here, uh, you know, a modification of it. So generally it's gonna be a carryover basis we then say, hey, you have to subtract out any liabilities you assumed or any liabilities the uh, transferee assumed. You have to subtract out any boot you received. So it's basically general rule is carryover basis modified by this right here. And again, why do we care about all of this? Because if we then go and sell that stock, we need to know what our basis in it is. Continuing here on it, 16, let's look here. Actually, let's go back. I'm sorry, I, I didn't discuss this idea of boot right here. What we did talk about was general rule carryover basis, and we showed that, and then it's modified here by the liability assumed. Another way it can be modified, how you reduce it is through boot, right? So what is boot? Let's talk about that. Remember we said here, the argument is this, we transfer property for stock 
we say, hey, we have a disposition event. We don't have actual like liquid stock here, right? This is stock. We can't pay the tax liability on it. If, however, you were to trade uh, you know, a machine for stock with cash, that argument where you can't pay the tax liability isn't as strong, right? You have something extra that you received. That something extra is called boot. Basically, if you receive stock plus anything else that isn't stock, then you have to recognize the gain. And basically, the gain you're going to recognize, it's generally the lesser of the realized gain or the apportioned fair market value of the boot. That's a fancy way of saying uh, if you receive boot right here, you have to recognize at least the boot in gain. Let's look uh, at 1907, 198, but one of the ideas with this, right, is let's just say you get, uh, you trade a machine for stock plus $100. Generally, what you're going to do here is um, you're going to include that $100 of boot in income. But how you include it uh, is a little bit, it depends on uh, the item you gave. So if that machine that you gave uh, had ordinary income properties to it, you would treat all of the boot as ordinary income. If it was a 1231 asset, you would have to treat it, uh, the boot, as 1231 income. Where it gets tricky is where you give multiple items. Maybe you give a machine, a building, an inventory for stock plus cash. In that case, you know that you have uh, you know, the boot as your gain, but what the IRS makes you do is they kind of make you apportion that gain, the 100 bucks cash, across the different assets you gave in light of their character and their relative fair market value. That's a mouthful, but let's look at 19.7 and 19.8 here, right? So we have a shareholder. They transfer three pieces of property right here for 40 shares of stock in $60,000. There we go, there's the boot right there. You give three pieces of property for two things. You get stock and you get cash. We know that cash is boot. It's something other than stock. Uh, now the idea here is we have our fair market value in these items, we have our adjusted basis, and then we have our realized gain in this case for what's going on. So what it's saying here is we know that we have the boot, right? The $60,000 of boot. Uh, we gave multiple pieces of property, right? We gave inventory right there. We gave building right here. We gave land right here. What they want us to do is uh, we know that the boot right here, according to this, uh, is the lesser of what we're going to recognize in total is the lesser of the realized gain or the apportioned fair market value of the boot. And that's this, this guy right here. So what's going on here is, is essentially uh, we're looking at each item here. So we have the realized gain versus the fair market value apportionment of the boot, pick the lesser of. Realized gain versus fair market boot apportionment, pick the lesser of. Realize gain, fair market value, boot apportionment, pick the lesser of. That's what's going on with it. So basically with the fair market value uh, boot apportionment, you're going to take the 25 right here over the 375, multiply it by the $60,000 boot. There you go. There's the 4000 bucks. 10 versus 4. 4 is the lesser amount. Then you have uh, you know, $90,000 right here as the realized gain versus the 150 over the 375 times the boot. 24, pick the 24. This is just showing you pick the lesser of the two. Then what you do is you add them all up, right? You have the four plus the 24 plus the 32. That's gonna be your recognized gain. So in other words, hey, we had $60,000 of boot in this case, we're gonna recognize all of it right here, of which four from inventory is gonna be ordinary, 24 from building is gonna be 1231, and 32 from land is gonna be 12. 
31. Let's look at 19.8 here. Uh, this is again just showing this uh, example from the last one. It's saying, what is the shareholder's basis in that stock they received? So in this case, it's showing us this guy right here. We're basically following this. It's gonna be uh, the adjusted basis of what we gave. So we have that carryover basis right here of 175 plus the gain recognized right here from the shareholder on the event. So we recognize $60,000 of boot minus the fair market value of boot received equals 175, our basis in it. And essentially what's going on here, right? If you look at this, thus if we sell it uh, for its fair market value of 315,000, and our adjusted basis is 175, we're gonna have a recognized gain of 40. So in short, right, what's going on here is we had a $200,000 realized gain of which $60,000 right here in the last example, we immediately recognized the boot and the remaining $140,000 we defer until later on uh, until we sell the stock and how we did that right here is by how we modified our basis in it, right? Mechanically, remember you have to modify the basis uh, to calculate it. So I know this is a mouthful. I know it's a little bit complicated. Uh, so just take it one lecture at a time, unpack it slowly, and we'll go from there.